and author of Solving 9-11's set of books, including his latest, The War on Terror, The Plot to Rule the Middle East. Chris has a history degree from UC Santa Cruz with a focus on Israel and Palestine. He's written extensively on the Middle East, vote fraud, depleted uranium dangers, and the history and geopolitics of the 9-11 terror attacks. Chris joins us tonight as he continues to speak about 9-11 and tours across Europe and America. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Christopher Boleyn. Okay? Yeah. Very good. It's nice to be here. Nice to see all these friendly people that I've met before. Pleasure to be back here. Um, I'm not really on a tour this year. Uh, I was invited to speak at a USS Liberty event in Texas yesterday, and then I was invited by San Diego Truth Group, um, Nelise and, and Ted and, and my friends, um, to come and speak here. So. Um, this presentation is not so much about the details of September 11th. This presentation is about 17 years of deception. 9-11 is going to be the 17th anniversary coming up this week. And it's also 17 years of war. For 17 years, this country's been at war. And most people in this country are unaware of what this country, our United States, is doing in Syria, in Iraq, in Lebanon in Palestine, in, in, across, in Yemen, in Mali, in many countries. So what happened is that 9-11 was done to trick us into war. And if you understand, you need to understand what this war is all about. What is the real strategic plan that the United States, for example, Syria. Right now, the United States is on the verge of war with Russia in Syria. It's uh, heating up quite, quite quickly there. Um, the, the United States is involved in occupying the eastern third of the country, and Russia says, Russia and Syria says the Americans have to leave. But the United States says, so why are, why are U.S. troops occupying Syria, a nation where there is no U.S. interest whatsoever? Now, what I'm going to talk about in this presentation is what is the real strategic plan and who this plan serves. This is my... Uh, uh, my former, my previous uh, pro my protest at the Oscars about solving 9-11 ends the war. What that means is when you understand the truth about 9-11, the war is over for you. You will understand that the war is a hoax, is a lie. My background is I was an investigative journalist in Washington, D.C. when 9-11 happened. I have a B.A. in history. Uh, Israel and Palestine was my focus. I've written the solving 9-11 set of books and the war on terror, the plot to rule the Middle East. I have a lot of those little books with me left over from Texas, so if you'd like to get a copy of the book, whatever donation you want to give, take a copy home with you. It's a small book, it's very important. I made it to be small and concise because it's a very important message. Americans have to understand what the war on terror is all about. It's not at all about fighting terrorism. It's actually using terrorism to wage war against independent countries. So the Solving 9-11 set of books investigate various aspects of the, of the terror atrocity and my focus has always been from the beginning, who is behind 9-11 and why was it done? This is the large book, the original articles, contains my books for the first, my articles for the first 12 years I was working as a journalist on 9-11. Now, the war on terror was a policy coup by deception. It was blamed on Muslims in order to initiate the war on terror. Behind the war on terror is a covert plan to redraw the map of the Middle East. Iraq, Syria, to break these countries up into fragments. Understanding the origin of this plan is crucial to comprehending the deception that has changed our world. Both 9-11 and the war on terror have a common origin. They were con both conceived by Israeli military intelligence. That's not Mossad, that's Amman, A-M-A-N. In the 1970s, under the leadership of Menachem Begin, Menachem Begin was the leader of Israel in 1977. And when Begin came to power, that's when the, the real old terrorists took power in Israel. Menachem Begin was known, is known as the father of terrorism. This is Menachem Begin. He was born in Russia, came to Palestine in 42, became the leader of the Irgun in 44, bombed the King David Hotel in Jerusalem in 46, 
committed the Deir Yassin massacre in 48, where they massacred an entire Palestinian village, uh, created the Likud party in 1973, became prime minister in 77, and promptly invaded Lebanon in 1978. This is the emblem of the Irgun. This shows this larger uh, territory called Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. And this is what they aspire to. They aspire to creating a state, the, the Likudniks, from the, from the River Nile to the River Euphrates, and taking pieces of Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, along the way. It's interesting to note that the, although Menachem Begin was the head of the Irgun, which is part of Vladimir Jabotinsky's uh, Zionist movement, <coughs> Benjamin Netanyahu's father, Bibi Netanyahu's father, Benzio Netanyahu, was the executive director of the new Zionist movement when Jabotinsky died. Jabotinsky is the founder of this radical revisionist Zionism called the New Zionist Organization, founded in New York City. Here's the father of terrorism. In, this is Menachem Begin and Bibi Netanyahu. And in 1974, a British journalist asked Mr. Begin, how does it feel, in the light of all that's going on, to be the father of terrorism in the Middle East? And Begin said, in the Middle East, he said, in all the world. So he put on himself the mantle of being the father of terrorism in all the world. So 9-11, a little bit, we need a little bit more light than that. Oh. Okay. Okay. 9-11 was a false flag terror atrocity designed to instill fear and rage in the American population in order to get public opinion to support the war on terror. A pre-planned, the war on terror is a pre-planned Zionist war agenda to be waged under the pretext of fighting terrorism. So starting the war on terror was the reason why 9-11 was done. The war on terror itself is much older. So 9-11 was a policy coup in this country that brought us the, the global war on terror and a series of these disastrous and costly wars. This is from Iraq. They call it also, they also call this war on terror, they call it the long war. This is written by people who support the idea of fighting this war. Um, the war on terror is the longest and most expensive war in US history, yet there is very little public resistance to it and no public political debate on ending it. That's partly because there is no awareness in this country of what, we are, we, what we've done in Iraq or Syria. For example, last summer we, we bombed Mosul and Raqqa two very large cities, one in Syria, one in Iraq. And yet there were no pictures in the newspaper of, of what, we, what we were doing, none. Now this is what uh, President Trump said a few months ago. He said, we have spent seven trillion dollars, trillion with a capital T, seven trillion in the Middle East. You know what we have for it? Nothing, nothing. He's right. And this is from the, the man who wrote The Art of the Deal. So if this deal is so bad, as he, as he says, we need to reverse this deal. We need to understand it, that this deal is, is plundering the wealth of this country. How it works is that the, the war on terror is not just the name of a, it's not just a clever name. It's, it's a legal term for the authorization to use military force. What this means is that two days after 9-11, Congress passed a bill that gave the president the right to declare war in any place, in any country, against anybody who he thought was involved in 9-11, on his own determination. And these are some of the countries that have been, where they have used this authorization to wage war. But of course, have these countries all been involved in 9-11? No, of course not. So it's, it's a fraud. Here, the fraudulent war on terror is based on the official myth of 9-11. This gives you an example of, of how much money is being spent. We're spending $400 million per victim of terrorism in this country per year. $400 million per year per victim of terrorism. It's a fraud. The war on terror is an Israeli stratagem pushed by Netanyahu since 1979 to trick the United States into waging war against Israel's enemies. And George Bush, I mean, uh, Donald Trump has supported this lie when he, when he re-engaged in, in uh, Afghanistan. He said in August of last year, he said that 9-11, the worst terrorist attack in our history, 
was planned and directed from Afghanistan because that country was ruled by a government that gave comfort and shelter to terrorists. So although he said that he was, his instincts were against the war in Syria and Afghanistan, he supports the lie and supports the war. So the war goes on. This is Wesley Clark, who, who was running for president. He was a former general, a very high-ranking uh, commander of American forces in, in Europe in the 1990s during the uh, operation in Yugoslavia. And he said, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, if you're an American, you ought to be concerned about the strategy of the United States in this region. What is our aim? What is our purpose? Why are we there? Why are Americans dying in this region? That's, that's, you can ask yourself that question, why are Americans in Syria? Why are we in Afghanistan? Why are we in Iraq? Why? He said, what happened on September 11th is that we didn't have a strategy. We didn't have bipartisan agreement. We didn't have American understanding of it. And instead, we had a policy coup in this country, a coup, a policy coup. Some hard-nosed people took over the direction of American policy, and they never bothered to inform the rest of us. So when he says we didn't have American understanding of it, he's implying that we had some other country interpreting 9-11 for us, which is correct. It was Israel. Here is, the, here is the Defense Policy Board, three of the principal members of that, Paul Wolfowitz, Dove Zakheim, and Douglas Fife. Some of them are dual nationals. They're sitting at the table with the Israeli military chief of staff, Shal Mofaz. This is in the Pentagon in January 2002. And what they were discussing is what would be the American response to 9-11. And as, as Wesley Clark points out, he came across a memo. He was a very high-ranking officer. He was at the Pentagon after 9-11, and, he, and he, he saw Rumsfeld and Wolfowitz. And one of the generals called him in and said, sir, we've made the decision we're going to war with Iraq. This is 10 days after 9-11. He said, we're going to war with Iraq? Why? I don't know, he said. I came back a few weeks later. By that time, we were bombing Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? He said, sir, it's worse than that. We're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq, then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off with Iran. Well, as you can see from that list, uh, six of those seven countries have already been done and were threatening to wait, make war with Iran, with Iran any day. The sanctions and things, sanctions, the economic sanctions have been applied to Iran are a form of warfare. Now, what's happening here is that what's being applied is something called the Yenon Plan, the Israeli plan called Yenon, named after the author Oded Yenon. And this plan is an Israeli plan from a Likud strategist to break up the Arab states, starting with Iraq and Syria, into statelets, into small ethnic statelets. It's often called Balkanization, because that's what they did to Yugoslavia. Break it into a section with the Sunnis and the Shiites and the Kurds. And that's what's been, do that's what's been done to Libya. That's what they're do doing to Iraq. That's what they're trying to do in Syria. And what happened in Syria is they ran into an obstacle called Russia and Iran. And they've been thwarted. So this plan has been stymied by the presence of Russia. And they are really ticked off about that which is why they, there's so much anti-Russian propaganda, because they're, they're pushing, pushing, pushing for war to, to finish Syria, but also to have hostility with Russia and Iran. Now, this is Hillary Clinton in 2012. Uh, Hillary Clinton wrote in an email that the best way to help Israel is to use force in Syria to overthrow the government. This email proves that Obama and Clinton were, trying to, were, were seeking to overthrow the Syrian government, an elected government, in order to serve Israel. Now, this is a photograph from uh, Syria, near Damascus. This is the Palestinian camp. This photograph shows the Yarmouk camp. Now, it, it, today it's in ruins. It had a population of over 100,000 people. Today it has 200 left. The Yarmouk camp in, in Damascus lies in ruins, with hardly a single building that has not been destroyed or damaged. Almost all the Palestinian refugees who were there have now fled. This, this shows you how this war, this, in, this, in this incident, the Palestinian refugees were being targeted. This is a Palestinian camp. And what happened is ISIS infiltrated the camp. Then the war was waged against ISIS. And who got hurt? The Palestinians. ISIS is like a moving target. Wherever they put ISIS, then they go and attack. The same thing they did to Raqqa and Mosul. 
This is from Linda Hurd. She's a British expert on the Middle East. And she, she wrote this, is the United States waging Israel's wars? She said, there's one thing we do know. Oded Yanon's 1982 plan, the Zionist plan for the Middle East, is in large part taking shape. Is this coincidence? Was Yanon a psychic? Perhaps, she says, alternatively, we in the West are victims of a long-held agenda, not of our making and without a doubt, not in our interest. So we're spending all this money and, and fighting all this war and taking the food off American tables to fight a war for somebody else? What's going on here? This is the plan, the, the Israeli plan is to conquer this area between Iraq and Egypt and call it Eretz Israel. This is the plan of the Likud. The Likud doesn't, doesn't hide this. This is, what, this is what Irgun wanted to do. This is what Netanyahu wants to do. They aspire to this. This is part of their megalomaniac plan. And in order to do this, they foment, they foment strife between the various ethnic groups in these countries. And that's easy to do because there's Sunnis and Shiites and Christians and Jews and, and uh, Kurds. So what, they're, what they've done is that they've, they increase the tension by doing things like car bombs and, and, and uh, assassinations in order to get these groups to fight each other. And it, and it says, this is from the Yanon plan, the dissolution of Syria and Iraq is Israel's primary target on the Eastern Front. The dissolution of the military power of these states serves as the primary short-term target. That's exactly what the United States has been doing for the last 17 years. Actually, of course, the war in, in uh, Iraq has been going on for now 27 years, having begun in 1991. And in what, what the United States has also been involved in is supporting the Kurds in the north so that they've, they've tried to break away the Kurdish regions of these countries into separate countries called Kurdistan. Uh, it's important to note that in the northern part of Iraq, the Kurdish area, um, the major holder of the oil reserves in that area is a Rothschild company called Janelle Energy. Now this is what was going on last summer. This is in Mosul, Iraq. It's, I think, the second largest city in, in the country. It was pounded. The United States and Kurdish forces pounded the city for months and destroyed. This is the famous mosque of al-Nuri, destroyed in the battle. This is Raqqa. At the same time they were pounding Mosul, they were pounding Syria's Raqqa. At least half the city was totally destroyed. Now this is d destruction on a biblical level. This is the kind of thing you read about in the Old Testament, where they destroy, utterly destroy cities. Why is the United States destroying major cities in Iraq and Syria. What, what's the point? Why are we doing it? It's our tax dollars at work. They pounded this poor city with so many artillery, they wore out the art, they wore out the artillery pieces, the American artillery pieces they were using. They were firing so relentlessly. This is from the northern part of Iraq. It's, it, it was, it's, it's headed by a, a, comp, a family named the Barzani family. That was the leader, Masoud Barzani, with the turban there in the lower left. His father was Mustafa Barzani. In the upper photos, you can see that his father was very close to Mossad. There he is, his father speaking to the head of the Mossad in 1966, I think it was. And here is Mr. Barzani going to Israel and meeting Moshe Dayan. This is his son, and this is what his son was trying to do. His son was trying to create an independent Kurdistan in northern Iraq. And when they had these rallies, you can see that the Israeli flag flies right alongside with the Kurdish flag because this is a this is an Israeli plan to break up Iraq and Syria by giving the Kurds their own state. So here's September 11th happened 17 years ago and the media has imposed on us the public a false story, a narrative that radical Islamic terrorists were to blame for 9/11. Now, if you accept that logic, if you accept the the official story, you will be trapped, you will be trapped in their logic of war. But if you understand that the that 9-11 story is a lie, then you will understand that the war on terror is equally a fraud. And you'll be liberated from it. And that's what we have to do is we have to liberate ourselves. We have to understand the source of this terrorism in order to liberate ourselves from this madness and this war. And we have to, we have to liberate the whole country. We have to, we have, this has to be a popular movement. What they did is that they, after 9-11, on 9-11, they declared it an act of war. And here's, this is a CIA paper, USA Today. You see here it said they have 86% say attacks are acts of war. So in one day they had done a survey 
and, and give you this, this nice number that most people think is an act of war. Now, it's very important when you call it an act of war because it no longer is a crime that's going to be investigated and tried. It becomes a, an act of war. And that gives the president the right to take action and, and to get justice by waging war rather than having an investigation. Now, this is a quote from Larry Johnson, former deputy uh, of counterterrorism. He's talking about how these Florida, these Florida guys were, were not really who they, you know, the, the hijackers were not really who they said they were at all. He said, we don't have anything in history to compare with this. The only thing that comes close to it is a former Soviet intelligence operation. What he's saying is that the planning and, and the sophistication of the 9-11 plot was so complex that it was, it was something like the Soviets would have dreamed up. I went to Germany after 9-11 because I, I realized it would, be, it would be unsafe to be talking about how, the, writing articles about how this is all a lie when our country was going to war based on that lie. And I spoke to this man, the former president of German intelligence, and he told me that the deathly precision and magnitude of planning behind 9-11 would have needed years of planning. He said such an operation would have required the fixed frame of a state intelligence organization. So what state are we talking about? What state intelligence organization is behind 9-11? Well, another one of his friends, Andreas von Bülow, another former uh, German intelligence expert, told me right off the bat, I said, who do you think is behind it? He said Mossad. And, and when I wrote that in my newspaper, he was a little bit shocked because he said he had told the exact same thing to every German journalist but they never wrote it in the papers. They never repeated that. It wasn't, that was not reported. So I'm going to point out some of the, the key Israeli connections to 9-11. When Israel was being created in the 1940s, the US uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff did 13 papers to determine what would be the US policy regarding the new state of Israel. And what they wrote in the 13th paper, they wrote that Zionist strategy, Israeli strategy, will seek to involve the U.S. in a continuously widening and deepening series of operations intended to secure maximum Jewish objectives. And they define what were those Jewish objectives. They say one was the expansion of Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, into Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria. The second is the establishment of Jewish military and economic hegemony over the entire Middle East. That's what's going on. Now, this is to give you a, just an idea of Israeli or Zionist terrorism prior to the state of Israel. In 1944, Lehi, that's also the Stern Gang, assassinated the British minister, Lord Moyne, in Egypt. He was in charge of the whole Middle Eastern area for Britain. In 1946, they sent letter bombs to British officials, in, including the foreign minister. In 1946, they bombed the King David Hotel, Irgun, killing 93 people. In 47, the Irgun placed bombs at the colonial office in London. In 47, Leahy sent letter bombs to the Truman White House, to President Truman. In 48, Hagan, ha Haganah and Irgun bombed the Semiramis Hotel in Jerusalem. And in 48, Irgun and Le Leahy massacred the entire village of Dir Yassin, a Palestinian village near Jerusalem. That's just what they did before. That's just a very short list. There's many more things. And these are, this is the Jewish terrorist. When the Jewish terrorist bombed the King David Hotel, it was done by this man, Menachem Begin. He was in charge of the operation. And they blew up the hotel because that was the, that was the, the offices of the British intelligence, the British headquarters for the military mandate of Palestine. Killed 93 people. Uh, a little bit after that, a few months after that, they bombed the British embassy in Rome. And then this man, his name is Yitzhak Shamir, he was in charge of Lehi, or the Stern Gang. They killed the United Nations mediator to Palestine, who was sent there when the war broke out to try and make peace. They, his name is Volker Bernadotte. And they killed him. And you can see that this is the New York Times. They say the Stern group is blamed. And it was, it was very clear that this was, this was being done um, by Jewish terrorists, Zionist terrorists. Now, in 1948, then, Menachem Begin came to New York City at the end of the year. And Einstein lived in New York, Albert Einstein. And he and 26 Jewish intellectuals wrote a letter to the New York Times protesting um, Menachem Begin. And one of, the key chap one of the key parts of that letter said that the public avowals of Begin's party, the Irgun, the, what became the Likud, are no guide whatsoever to its actual character. 
Today they speak of freedom, democracy, and anti-imperialism, whereas until recently they openly preached the doctrine of the fascist state. It is in its actions that the terrorist party betrays its real character. From its past actions, we can judge what it may be expected to do in the future. That's exactly right. When Begin came to power in 1977, he began employing, once again, his tactic of terrorism. 77, they came to power. These are three of the, the triumvirate. That's Begin and uh, Ariel Sharon and Yitzhak Shamir. Now, it's interesting that there's a, a book uh, by an Israeli called Rise and Kill First that's a bestseller on the New York Times. And in that book, it reveals that this man, Chief of Staff Rafael Eitan, in, in 90, from 1979 to 1983, when Menachem Begin took power, this man ran a terrorist organization in Lebanon called the Front for the Liberation of Lebanon from Foreigners, in which they used car bombs and truck bombs to foment strife and war. They wanted to give a reason for Israel to get to war with the Palestinians in Lebanon and for the factions in Lebanon to fight each other. This is exactly what they did in Lebanon for those years and what they did, did in Iraq re until recently. Car bombs in between Sunnis and Shiites and Kurds so that you get groups fighting each other. It's an Israeli specialty. Yeah. This is the book. Uh, this is a little extract from the book. The aim was to create chaos amongst the Palestinians and Syrians in Lebanon without leaving an Israeli fingerprint to give them the feeling they were constantly under attack and to instill them with a sense of insecurity. Now that's what they did in Lebanon for four years. That's what they did in Iraq for 10 years. That's what they're doing to this country since 2001. Look at what happened after 2001. Remember the, the bombs in Bali. After 9-11, they had bombs in Bali, bombs in Madrid, bombs in London, bombs in everywhere. And that was to, they, they, they took their, their scare tactics and went global with it. And that's what they want to do with us. They want us to be in fear. That's what the terrorism is all about, is to, is to make us afraid to allow them to do what they want to do with their wars. And, you know, in the final year of their, their little operation in Lebanon, they destroyed the Marine barracks in Beirut, killing 241 Marines. And there was one truck bomb Sunday morning, very early, came in and drove in and blew up the barracks. And Caspar Weinberger, who was defense minister at the time, uh, Secretary of Defense, said there, is, there was no knowledge, we, America has no knowledge who did the bombing. It was blamed on some little group called Islamic Jihad, which had no history, no past, no, no return address. You know, I surmise that this was the, another operation done by the Mossad. And, and the basis of that is, is that Viktor Ostrovsky in his book, the, By Way of Deception, he's an Israeli Mossadnik from Canada, he said that Mossad knew the specific time and location of the bombing, but only gave the United States general information which was worthless. So Americans paid with their lives. And here are the Israeli terrorists of the 1950s. They're pretty famous men. This is uh, Shimon Peres, and that's Moshe Dayan, and this is Pinhas Lavon. This photograph was taken just a few months after they were caught putting bombs in American and British buildings in Cairo. And this was another false flag operation. Going back to the 1950s, they wanted to bomb American libraries and films and, uh, and theaters and what have you in order to turn the American government and the American people against the Arabs, especially, specifically against Egypt. And here's Shimon Peres, after, just after he did this, the, the prime minister of the country at the time was shocked. And he said that Shimon Peres shares the same ideology as Pinas Lavon. He wants to frighten the West into supporting Israel's aims. This is the name of the game. This is what we're still are at today. Shimon Peres was the, prime, was the foreign minister of Israel when 9-11 happened. They want to scare the American people into accepting the Israeli logic of war so that we will then fight Israel's enemies because we're so frightened of them. Now, I, this is what we were speaking about yesterday in Texas. This is the uh, attack on the USS Liberty. It happened in 1967 during the Six Day War on June 8th. And Israel mercilessly attacked this ship, killing 34 Americans pounded the ship, and the communications between the pilots and the, the ground control went something like this at the crucial moment. They said, identify the ship, and the pilots said, it's American, it's American. Then the command came from 
And the Americans picked up as if it was really a Libyan message. Oh, Libya is saying, congratulations on the job well done. And they tricked the Americans into thinking, ha, huh, Libya did it, see? And Ronald Reagan went and bombed. So that's, that's just an idea of some of the deception, how Israel operates to get us to attack their enemies. The war on terror, the evolution of an Israeli stratagem. A stratagem is a trick, a device to trick a nation, to trick people. In uh, 1978, the Israeli super agent Arnon Milkan made his first film called Medusa Touch. The climactic scene is a Boeing passenger aircraft flying into the Pan Am building in New York. This is 1978. You see, what I'm trying to show is that the ideation, the plan, the planning of 9-11 and the war on terror all began at the same time in the late 1970s when Begin came to power. Here's the, the planning and the preparation for the film. This is his very first film that he made. This is a very famous film director, uh, producer today. He made JFK and Brazil, Pretty Woman, films like that. Fight Club. Yeah, Fight Club, thank you. And here's the first film that he made, and this is, uh, you know, shows the, the scene of the plane flying into the building. And to give you an idea of his connections to the, the highest level of the Israeli military, here he is talking with Ezra Weitzman in 1978, the same year he made the film. This is Arna Milchan. This is him more recently. He's a very high senior Israeli agent. He's a nuclear smuggler and a money launderer. What his basic function has been is he has been like the banker for Israel, for offshore bank accounts for them to run their military intelligence operations. So he holds the, he holds the, mon, the, fun, the funds to fund their operations abroad. And he was involved in the nuclear smuggling of uh, triggers for nuclear bombs, 850 of them. His company is called Milco in California. And this man was working for him at the time. Netanyahu was his employee. And of course, when the indictment came out for this nuclear smuggling, the uh, uh, Treasury Department, I think it was, said that we, we, we I can just tell you one thing he said, that Arnon Milkan is not named in the indictment. So his American employees went to jail, went into exile, but he was not even named in the indictment. And the uh, FBI went to Israel and said, we would like to have those nuclear triggers back, please. The Israelis gave them half of them back. It shows you who's in power there. And here we have, this is a film that his business partner named Rupert Murdoch, a news corporation, made in the year 2000, aired on TV March 2001, in which a, a, a a Boeing passenger plane is remotely hijacked and flown into the World Trade Center. At the very last minute, the pilots are able to avert a catastrophe. They just narrowly miss hitting the building. This was shown on, on Fox TV in March 2001. Milkan and Murdoch are business partners. They own TV companies together. So most likely this, op this idea came from Mr. Milkan because it seemed to be his obsession. Here's the father of Israeli intelligence named Isser Harel, and he predicted 9-11 in 1979. He predicted it to this, uh, this tall fellow here, Michael Evans, here's with Menachem Begin, and Isser Harel predicted that Arab terrorists would attack the tallest buildings in New York City. He made his prediction, of course, 14 years before the first bombing and 22 years before 9-11. How amazingly prescient that the head of Israeli intelligence knew what Arabs would do 20 years down the road. This is what he said in 1979. He said, do you th that Mr. Evans said, do you think terrorism will come to America? And if so, where and why? Harrell said, I fear it will come to you in America. America has the power but not the will to fight terrorism. You see where they're thinking in 1979 already? The terrorists have the will but not the power to fight America. But that could all change with time. Arab oil money buys more than tents. As to the where, Harrell continued, New York City is the symbol of freedom and capitalism. It's likely they will attack the Empire State Building, your tallest building, and a symbol of your power. So that prediction was made in 1979. So all of this goes back to 78, 79. They, they're planning the war on terror. They're planning 9-11. That's the ideation, creating the, creating the idea. Now, what happened is that Netanyahu, this man here, he was working for Boston Consulting Group, a Rothschild company in Boston. In 1979, he went back to Israel, and with his father, he created something called the Netanyahu Institute, and they began promoting the war on terror. 
Their first conference was in 1979 in Jerusalem, called the International Terrorism Conference on, on Terrorism. And he then began writing books, well, taking the speeches, for example, and, and, and putting them together in book form. Terrorism, how the West can win, fighting terrorism. And in these books, Netanyahu puts forth his doctrine. The doctrine basically goes like this, that Israel is attacked by Arab terrorists simply because it's a Western state with Western values. Therefore, the real target is the West. Therefore, it's incumbent on the West to come to the Middle East to fight the bad terrorists because the real target is the West. Well, you know, that's, that's, it worked. It worked, however absurd it sounds, it worked very well. Now, if you're going to have a war on terrorism, you've got to have a really good enemy, a very colorful, naughty, nasty enemy. Because the average Muslim is not a good enemy. So they had to create something. And they, created, they started creating it in the 1980s in Pakistan. And it was the gang of Gulbuddin, uh, Gulbuddin Hekmatyar. And what happened is that Israeli military intelligence sent the men and the weapons to Pakistan. The Americans, under Charlie Wilson, and the Saudis paid for it all. We paid for it, Saudi CIA paid for it, Saudi Arabia paid. The Israelis collected the money, gave the weapons that they had taken from Beirut, from Lebanon, and the Israelis, who have plenty of Arabic-speaking agents, trained these people in terrorism. And one of the first Afghan Arabs was this man here, Osama bin Laden. And this, was, this operation began in 1983 when Ehud Barak, this man, was the head of Israeli military intelligence. This is, the, this is Charlie Wilson, the, Texas, the congressman from Texas who was behind the whole thing. If you, you've seen the book, movie Charlie Wilson's War, read the book. Um, and this is the man that they were funding, Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, right here. What's interesting about this, most peculiar, is that the CIA and Saudi Arabia were funding the most anti-Western group out there. Not only that, this man, this, this group in the Hekmatyar's group, never, never had a successful battle with the Russians, and they were always stirring up dissent with other groups. But most, most importantly, they were anti-Western. Now, why would the CIA and the Saudi Arabia be funding an anti-Western group? Because they were creating the foe for the coming war. And how it was being done, it was being done with this man, the head of the Mossad in Washington, his name is Zvi Rafia. He was managing Charlie Wilson. They were close friends, and, and he, was, he was like Charlie Wilson's mentor. And Rafia used Charlie Wilson's office as if it were his own. Here you see a quote from the book, Charlie Wilson's War. He said, one of the staffers kept a list of people he needed to lobby. He would use the phones, give projects to the staff, and call on Charlie to intervene whenever he needed him. So this Israeli, this Israeli station chief from Mossad is using a congressman's office as if it were his own. And, they, and this is the first trainer for bin Laden. This is bin Laden's first trainer. His name is Ali Muhammad. What's interesting about this man is Ali Muhammad is a fluent Hebrew-speaking double agent. He's supposedly Egyptian, but he speaks fluent Hebrew. Well, where did he learn that? Well, he's one of these double agents. And he trained Osama bin Laden. He trained the guys that, that shot Rabbi Kahane. He, he, he was involved in setting up the operation in, in Egypt, or in, excuse me, in uh, East Africa, where they blew up the embassies. He was involved in all this stuff. Uh, what was eventually happened, he was finally caught, and he was put in a federal penitentiary, where he vanished from without a trace. And the people that he created, the gang that he created, is the, these guys. And in 1994, they became Al-Qaeda, and the, the ones that spoke Pashto and the Afghans became Taliban. So these were all the men that had been trained in terrorism and technology by the Israeli military intelligence. Then in 1987, Israeli Mossad tried to get security contract for the World Trade Center. And they sent this man to get it, the former head of Shin Bet, Avraham Shalom. And the, the company was called Atwell Security of Tel Aviv, and they got the contract from the Port Authority, uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a terrorism contract, a terrorism security contract for the World Trade Center. And what happened, though, is that the uh, Port Authority discovered that Mr. Shalom Bendor was using a fake name. He, they often Israeli, Israelis use different names than they have. And they found that he was guilty of murder back in Israel, of killing a couple Palestinians with uh, rocks. 
crushing their heads and having it approved that operation. And they, they, the Port Authority tore up the contract. But had that contract not been torn up by the Port Authority, 9-11 would have happened in the light, in, like in 1980s or so, which would have put us at a big disadvantage because we didn't have the internet. We only would have read about it in New York Times and Time Magazine, and we would be clueless about what really happened. The internet has been a big game changer for us. It's allowed us to communicate and to get information that we would not otherwise have gotten. Now, when, they, when, when Shalom Bendor and, and Zvi Malkin, I have to explain who these guys are. They're high Mossad agents. They're very high Mossad agents. They're the guys that worked under Issa Harel. Remember the guy that made the prediction in 79? These were his lieutenants. These are the men who went to Argentina and kidnapped Eichmann. These are the men who were involved in the smuggling plutonium from Pennsylvania to Israel for the nuclear bombs. So these are very high level men. They came to America in the, in the early 1980s and um, Zvi Malkin, that guy, and Shalom Bendor. And the company that they headed, Atwell Security, had been created by Shaul Eisenberg, who was Mr. Big, Israel's Mr. Big in China. You, that's another story, but it's an, you have to remember that name, Shaul Eisenberg. He was the biggest, like a James Bond mega criminal. So what happened when they were when the, when their when their contract was torn up by the Port Authority, they didn't leave. They didn't go back to Israel. They didn't they didn't call it quits. What they did is they went to work for some American Jews who had already inside track. These two men, Jules Kroll on the top and Maurice Greenberg. Maurice Greenberg is the guy that used to run AIG, which is the company that got the the big the big bailout in 2008 2009. He had he had the insurance company that had had insured the banks. So this man, Kroll Associates, Kroll, had a company that in 1993 got the security contract for the World Trade Center after the first bombing. There was a bombing in the basement. Then his company had the, had the security contract, and the Israeli guy was working for him. So the Israeli was using the American Jew as a Trojan horse to get in, into the operation that they wanted to get into. Uh, this man is also a, a key player in the 9-11 saga. He was involved, he was the special advisor to Bill Clinton. His name is Rahm Emanuel. He's the mayor of Chicago. Um, this is the guy that ran the Clinton White House. For example, NAFTA. When, when Bill Clinton was elected in 1992, this guy got NAFTA through Congress in 1993, single-handedly. He's very nasty. He gives threats. He threatens people. He uses all kinds of ways to get people to do what he wants. Um, he was also the first person appointed by Barack Obama, chief of staff. So you see, when, when Clinton was the president, a lot of the people were being put in position for the 9-11 saga to go into action. And therefore, he was the Mossad man in the White House. He was the Israeli agent in the White House. He served in the Israeli army, and his father was, the, uh, his father was a member of that Lehi gang, the Stern gang, that killed all those people. In 1993, they had the first bombing of the World Trade Center, and this 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 was an event that wasn't it wasn't meant to bring down the World Trade Center. Whoever made that bomb, the FBI supposedly is the one that made it active, um, was not meant to bring down the towers. It was meant to impress on the American people that Arabs want to bring down the World Trade Center, so that when a few years later, ten years later, when the when the when the 9/11 happened, people would automatically think, oh, the Arabs did it. Of course, haven't you seen the movies? They made good on their promises, on their threats. Now, this crime was, was prosecuted by Michael Sheratov, who's an Israeli citizen, who was also the person who was responsible for prosecuting 9-11. Um, he was, at that time, in 1993, he was the US attorney for New Jersey. And his a fellow Zionist judge named Michael Mukasey presided over the case of the blind sheikh. This was the bombing. I think six people were killed. It happened in February 1993. Now what happened, this is very interesting, this is all written in the New York Times, that the FBI was paying this man, an Egyptian colonel, Ahmad Salem, he was paid $1 million for his testimony. What he did was basically snooker or corral people like the blind sheikh into positions where they were indictable. They said something, they were someplace, they, they appeared guilty. And so that this, this was like a sting operation. And, and the sting, the stinger was this Egyptian guy. 
And this man went to jail for like 5,000 years, the blind sheikh, while this guy got a million dollar payout from the FBI and went into the eyewitness, the witness protection program, never to be seen again. Now, in 1997, 1998, Philip Zelikow ran something called the Catastrophic Terrorism Study Group, in which they imagined a transforming event which would change America. And this was in Foreign Affairs magazine. You can see that it's Philip Zelikow, John Deutsch, and Ashton Carter. And they were imagining the transforming event that would basically change this nation. They were talking about 9-11. And the men that wrote this along, Philip Zelikow is the man who wound up being the executive director of the 9-11 Commission Report. Um, the other two are Ashton Carter here and John Deutsch. And this photograph was taken at the time that they were working on this paper. And they were working for a company called Global Technology Partners, which is an exclusive affiliate of Rothschild North America. So you see, what I'm trying to show you in some of these slides is that the Rothschilds, these big banksters, bankers, are always one step removed from the actual crime or from the actual plotting of the crime. But they're in every, in every, every place you find their footprints. So then these Zionist neocons called for a, a new Pearl Harbor in order to change the American military policy. This was a, a, a document written by the PNAC, the Project for a New American Century, which is headed by this, the family here, the Kagan family. And they wanted to change the American military policy so that America would become the global police force, that America would dominate the entire planet. And they said the process of transformation even if it brings revolutionary change, it's likely to be a long one, absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. Then we had, and when 9-11 happened, we had the security of the World Trade Center towers and the security of the airports was both in the hands of the Mossad. Here you had the company, these are the principal players of the airplane company, this passenger screening company called Huntley USA. It was owned by an Israeli company called ICTS. And here are the chairmen of the ICTS. Here are the executives of ICTS. The man in the middle is, is Yair Shamir. He's is Yitzhak Shamir's son. If any of you remember having seen Yitzhak Shamir, he's a small, very thuggish man, speaks very brutally. He was a murderer. He murdered lots of people. And he got his son to head this company. And these other two guys are Rothschild agents, this is Kukerman and Boaz Harel. Their company oversaw all passenger screening on 9-11 for those airports involved. So the question was, if these guys got on the plane, how did they get on the plane? Were they on the plane? Well, this is all part of the deception. 15 of these 19 hijackers lived in Florida, where duplicate licenses were, had been issued for at least six of them. Others had reported lost passports. What you're dealing with here is you're dealing with a situation where somebody's identity has been stolen using duplicate, duplicate documents. And these duplicate documents are used to create a false history. Then we knew after 9-11, this is from uh, September 23rd, BBC reported that at least seven of the hijackers were still alive. So if, if, if seven of them were still alive and the others were having duplicate licenses, who was on the plane? Were there hijackers? Were there any? If, they, if there were actually hijackers, why did not a single pilot get a chance to push the 7500 warning that we've been hijacked? Not a single one of the planes sent out the signal that takes one second to send we were being hijacked. And what happened here is that the FBI director said, he said, this is in 2001, he said, what we are currently doing is determining whether, when these individuals came to the United States, these were their real names, or they changed their names for use with false identification in the United States. Because this, in Florida, they realized that this was all a big game. False identities, you know, somebody playing the name, playing the role of this guy. And then in September 2002, Mueller said, this is the guy that's leading the Russian investigation. He was head, he was head of the FBI at the time, a brand new guy in the job. He said that, uh, he told CNN that there is no legal proof to prove the identities of the suicidal hijackers. So we have no idea who, who, if anybody, hijacked those planes. And this is from the Mossad book. This is to, the Little Drummer Girl. I recommend reading this book to people who like to read spy books because this book explains how Israel does this. 
John Le Carre wrote this book in 1982 with help from Israeli military intelligence leaders. And in the book, the Mossad guy tells this woman who's the actor, actress who's helping them along with this plot. He says, terror is theater. The theater's a con trick. You know what that means, con trick? You've been deceived. That's what it, it's all a big deception. And that's what the, the whole thing's a deception. This, this nation has been deceived for the last 17 years. And, and what I try to, in, try to tell people is that a nation that is deceived into war is a nation that is enslaved. So in, nine, in, in July 2001, the Zionists, the Zionists, again, the Israeli faction, got the lease for the World Trade Center. How it worked is that this man, Ronald Lauder, son of, son of Estee Lauder, he was in charge of the privatization scheme for the state of New York, uh, for Governor Pataki. He also has a school in Israel at the Mossad University IDC in Herzliya, where this Israeli general, Daniel Rothschild, heads the Institute for Policy and Strategy. So these two men have a great deal to do together back in Israel. And Rothschild probably told him, well, you make sure that we privatize those World Trade Centers and make sure they go to Larry Silverstein. That's what happened. Larry Silverstein did not have the money to take the World Trade Centers to run it. He was lent the money to take over the buildings by uh, some of his partners at GMAC, who went bankrupt in 2008. And what happened is that the executive director of the, of the uh, Port Authority, this man, Louis Eisenberg, and this man, uh, Larry Silverstein, they're partners in the Zionist organization called the UJA Federation. Silverstein was the, the chairman, Eisenberg was on the planning board. And he oversaw the negotiations that brought the World Trade Center to him. So they, they wanted to get their guy in possession. In order for the operation to go ahead, they had to control the entire property. Now, Silverstein is also a very close friend of Netanyahu, kind of like Donald Trump. But these two guys were speaking on the phone every Sunday afternoon for years prior to 9-11. What, pray tell, were they talking about every Sunday afternoon? And this is uh, July 24th, 2001, when Larry Silverstein got the keys to the front door, figuratively. And he said, I am proud to assume the stewardship of the World Trade Center, one of New York City's finest, greatest jewels. And five weeks later, this was left of those, this is what was left of those jewels. Nothing but dust and steel. Now, another strange thing is that this man, Ehud Olmert, the deputy prime minister of the state of Israel, this guy, and mayor of Jerusalem, was in New York City on September 10th and September 11th. But what's peculiar about his visit to New York City on September 10th and September 11th is that it was kept secret. Usually, if an, if an Israeli politician of that stature comes to New York, it's, a, it's front page news. But in this case, it was kept secret. That's Giuliani. So the question is, why was his visit, why was he in New York City on September 10th and 11th, and why was it kept secret? Here he is. He, he just got out of jail. He's been in jail for a couple years now in Israel. And he came back to, he came back to New York City about uh, two weeks later, having been, I guess, uh, coached back in Israel. And he came back, and he acted the role of the big brother, because New York City and Jerusalem are, after all, sister cities. And here he's with John McCain. But he was in New York City on September 10th and 11th. Why was his visit kept secret? That's the question. And on September 11th, as we now know, on the afternoon when all the planes were grounded in this country, one 747LL took off from New York City. A full Boeing 747 took off from JFK to Israel, to Tel Aviv, on September 11th. The flight departed at 4.11 p.m with US military officials on the scene and personally involved to clear the flight for takeoff. Who was on the plane? These were the, these were the rats getting off the, you know, they, they, were, they were getting away. The culprits were getting away. Now this, this is a question about, you may have heard about the put options. There were a lot of people who bet that the airline stocks would tank on September 11th. They knew something in advance. And all of those, as the 9-11 Commission report said, about this, uh, they said that a single U.S. Inv institutional investor with no conceivable ties to Al-Qaeda purchased 95% of the United Airlines puts. But the, the guy that used to head that company that, that put all those options was this man here. His name is Buzzy Krongord. 
Uh, Kronengard is a, a fake uh, Scandinavian name. He's a Jewish guy from Poland. But um, they changed the name. But the thing is, he was executive director of the CIA. So when people talk about what was the CIA's involvement in 9-11, you have to understand that within a company or uh, organization like the CIA, you have factions. You have compartmentalized factions. You have groups that are involved in something in that room, and there's a group involved in something in that room, and they know nothing about what each other is doing. But Buzzy Krongord, the executive director, knows what everybody's doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And his company, he used to be the head of that bank, Alex Brown Bank, investment bank in Baltimore, that placed all those options. You see? Now, here's Alvin Krongord. That's his name, Buzzy Krongord. And here you see, here he is in the middle. And here's his wife, his Shiksa wife from Iowa. And she is connected directly to Rothschild Asset Management. And they live in a huge, this is their, this is their palatial estate in, outside of Baltimore. And then there's the issue of the thousands of Israelis who were expected to be at the World Trade Center that day. This is from the Jerusalem Post, September 12th. And the foreign ministry had received the names of 4,000 people, who, Israelis, who they expected to be at work at the World Trade Center or in the area of the World Trade Center or the Pentagon on 9-11. And these families had called up, to the Jerusalem, uh, called up to the foreign ministry asking about their loved ones. Only four Israelis died on 9-11. And so there was a, uh, a warning that was given to them. And that warning went out on something called Odigo. And this is another article from the Israeli paper Haaretz about how Odigo people who had this instant messaging service, an Israeli messaging service, got messages on their cell phone or on their, uh, their, uh, their uh, email or whatever platform that they had, um, telling them not to, go, not to go to the World Trade Center that day, that something terrible was going to happen. And the prediction was precise to the minute, that at, at 8.45 on 9-11, something terrible was going to happen and avoid going there. So it appears that those 4,000 Israelis who avoided disaster that day got the memo. These are the five dancing Israelis. This is a very, this is a, one of the first indications. I wrote my first article about these guys because on September 11th, I was in New York City early in the morning. We couldn't go to Washington. We had to drive back to Chicago. And I was in Pennsylvania listening about noon on the radio. And they said, uh, Ted Koppel came on and said that five Middle Eastern men were seen photographing and <coughs> celebrating the attack on the World Trade Center. I told my wife they could be Israelis. And it turned out, lo and behold, they were Israelis. And it was reported in the uh, local paper in New Jersey uh, called the Bergen Record. And these are the five men. These two are Mossad agents, the Kurtzberg brothers, and these three are like their operatives, minions. Um, these three appeared on TV in Israel and talked about what they did. And they, this guy, Oded Elner, he said that the, our purpose was to document the event. Now, their purpose included that they were on the scene, parked in the parking lot on the, on the Jersey side, with their cameras already prepared to take pictures when the first building hit, when the first plane hit the building. The first plane. So they were, they were clued in. They knew what was going to happen. And they worked for a fake moving company called Urban Moving Systems in Weehawken, New Jersey, which the Forward newspaper, a Jewish paper in New York, reported in March of 2002 was a Mossad front operation. It was a front. Its whole purpose was to facilitate the 9-11 operation. This is, the, this is the head of the company. He fled to Israel. His name is uh, uh, Dominic Suter. And this is one of their trucks. This is one of their moving trucks. And you can see it's been decorated. This is on 9-11. The truck's been decorated with a plane flying into the World Trade Center. I mean, how, but chutzpah, in your face, in your face, America. And then on 9-11, after the, this is going on, before the towers have fallen down, before the dust has settled, this guy who trained Osama bin Laden, this guy, again, this is Ehud Barak, he's the guy that trained Osama bin Laden, He's speaking on BBC. He just happened to be in London and happened to be in the studio of the BBC ready to give the interpretation. Remember how General Clark said we did not have American understanding of it? No, we got Israeli interpretation of it. Interpretation. And, and what Ehud Barak said 
it's time to launch an operational concrete war against terror. And that's what we did. But he began this little clip, this little paragraph. He said that the world will never be the same from today on. That's the part that really bugs me. That our world has been radically distorted and changed for the worse, and it's all based on deception. It really causes me a great deal of sadness to come to my country today and see what's become of this country. To see that this country is woefully, woefully deceived into war and clueless and apathetic about what we're doing. We're destroying nations of the Middle East willy-nilly like, like some biblical barbarians. And the American people don't even know it. And if they do find out about it, they really don't care. They're living in la-la land. We can't go on like this. On 9-11, Benjamin Netanyahu praised the attacks because they kick-started his war on terror, Israel's war on terror. We are being dragged around the Middle East like a bull with a ring in its nose. He said on 9-11, it's very good. He told us in the New York Times, he said, it's very good. He's talking about the, the structure of the World Trade Center. He said, well, it's not very good, but it'll generate immediate sympathy. He said that to the New York Times, James Bennett. He was asked, how will 9-11 how will affect Israeli-American relations? And he said, it's very good. He was gleeful. He was joyful about what happened. At that, on that day, if you remember, it was estimated that 30,000 Americans were dead in the rubble. That's what they thought that for the first week. Now, what's the connection between Ehud Barak and, and Netanyahu? Well, they're comrades from the Sayeret Matkal. Sayeret Matkal is a covert commando force which serves directly under the Israeli chief of staff. And Barak was his commander. So you see, they're, they're sharing a little secret here. And the day after 9-11, Netanyahu said, we must build a coalition against terror today. It's time to take on the militant Islamic regimes with a great deal of strength. We should crush the terrorist infrastructure that threatens the entire free world. Now, if you look at the coalition in Iraq, in Syria, this, this war on terror, you will never see the Israeli flag. You will see, for example, in Operation Inherent Resolve, the attacks in what we were doing in Raqqa and Mosul, the flags of 67 nations, but not the Israeli flag. Who well, are the Israelis? Well, the Israelis are kept out of the picture. But just this week, if you watch the news, if you read the news about Syria, you will see that Israel has admitted to bombing Syria 200 times in the last two years. They said, we're not playing any role in this war, but they bombed the country 200 times. And then it came out also in Haaretz newspaper a couple days ago, that Israel has been supporting and funding and arming 12 of the rebel groups that were fighting against the Syrian government of, of Assad. 12 of them. They've been paying these people $5,000 a piece. Some of them only getting $75 a month. But it's all been an Israeli operation. And this is a quote from Mr. Netanyahu as well. Once we squeeze all we can out of the United States, it can dry up and blow away. Nice guy. These are our friends. And now, who would say that 9-11 was a good thing except somebody who saw some benefit? And he admitted in Hebrew, in plain Hebrew, in, in, in the year 2008, he said to an Israeli audience, we, Israelis, are benefiting from one thing, and that is the attack on the Twin Towers and Pentagon and the American struggle in Iraq. Israel is benefiting from the American struggle in Iraq. We're not benefiting from it. Now, this is the man who was in charge of the investigation, or the non-investigation. Because you have to understand that 9-11 was not investigated as a crime. It became an act of war. Therefore, there was no investigation. But this was the man, attorney, Assistant Attorney General Michael Sheratoff, who should have investigated 9-11, who should have preserved the evidence. But he didn't. He's actually an Israeli national, and his mother was a Mossad agent. So an Israeli citizen was in charge of the non-investigation of 9-11. This should have happened. This is all under John Ashcroft. So you see, John Ashcroft was number one, Attorney General. This is number two. And as we, we now know, we've known since the beginning, that for day-to-day -day decisions, Sheratoff had the last word. And then George Bush made him the head of Homeland Security. It's important to note that in his positions, Sheratoff's positions in both places, Homeland Security and, and Department of Justice, he was in charge of the evidence of 9-11. He made sure that nobody could see it, that it was destroyed, et cetera, et cetera. 
Now, the destruction of, crime, uh, destruction of evidence from a crime like 9-11 is a crime in and of itself. So if you want to investigate, if you want to find out who's really behind 9-11, you need to prosecute people who committed actual crimes. And he committed the crime of destruction of evidence. He should have investigated the crime. The FBI serves beneath him. Then they, they managed the destruction of evidence. Zionists Zionist oversaw the two junkyards where the steel was destroyed were Zionist owned junkyards. So there was all this steel that had to be destroyed because the steel had evidence that would indicate that the buildings were blown up. And then Zionists presided over the 9 11 lawsuits and litigation. This is the Judge Hellerstein. He handled the 9 11 tort litigation. And what, what the problem with this tort litigation was, thank you, is that his son is a lawyer in Israel, Joseph, and his, son, his, his son's law firm represented the key defendant in the, in the tort litigation that his father was presiding over in New York. That's that ICTS company I told you about that oversaw passenger screening. They were the key defendant in the, in the tort litigation. That's when there were 96 families left who wanted to know how these guys got on the plane, who's responsible. And that, that litigation was overseen by this man, but his son was working for the key defendant. We tried to make that case, we tried, I tried very hard to make that known to people in New York, say, but nobody really cared. Um, a few years later, um, uh, a lawyer from Temecula, who was the lawyer for uh, Ellen Mariani, one of the widows, he tried to get that information that I had discovered put into, this, into the record. And he was scolded. He was scolded by the court, and they said that this is anti-Semitic by the Supreme Court. It's anti-Semitic to try to put this information into the record. This is the, how it worked. Is that's his son. That's the, that's the judge for the 9-11 tort litigation. That's his son in Israel. His son represented Kukerman, that, that man I showed you before. Kukerman is CEO of Rothschild Group. And these guys, their company owned ICTS which is a Rothschild-funded Mossad company. So you see, again, everywhere you look, Israeli intelligence, Mossad, and Rothschilds. Now, these are the people that oversaw the distribution of the, of the compensation fund. The first compensation fund, which 2,900 families accepted, was overseen by Ken Feinberg, a very high-level Zionist. His wife is on the board of governors of the Jewish Agency. She works with him on this operation. So they paid off the first 2,900 families. There were roughly 100 families left, 96 families left, who wanted their day in court to understand what, who was responsible for the loss of their loved one. And Sheila Birnbaum, this woman down here, she waged war, a war of attrition against those families. So that like, you know, twice the number of people in, in this room, one by one they settled these families out of court until there was no one left standing. So 9-11 is a crime of the century, the worst terrorist crime in US history, and has not had one day in court yet for a single one. And those families have all been bought off. They've signed the line, no, no further litigation. They, nobody has standing anymore. But there still are people that have standing, actually. There are people that were exposed to the dust, for example. They could, they could make claims. There's other ways you could probably skin this operation. Now, the Zionists also control the myth and the legacy. Here we're talking about this operation, this uh, memorial at Ground Zero. It was designed by Israelis, built by Israelis. Yeah. Uh, here we have Philip Zelikow. He's the man who oversaw the 9-11 Commission report. This is the man I told you about that had the catastrophic study terrorism group who wrote in 1998 that catastrophic terrorism will soon come to America. He was then put in charge of writing the 9-11 Commission. And he came to the commission with the outline already written. And it was, uh, he, had, he had framed the entire document before any of the people even began meeting. So it was, he, 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 his specialty is creating a myth. And that's what they did. They created this myth that they could give to the American people. But the people that were on the commission, like uh, John, John Farmer here, said that he was a senior counsel. He said, but the government and military officials told Congress, the commission, the media, and the, and the public about who knew what when was almost entirely and inexplicably untrue. So the, the commission report is not worth the paper it's written on. This is, these are the two chairmen, co-chairmen, and Thomas Keene, the one in the foreground, said, to this day, we don't know why NORAD told us what they, know, what they told us. It was just so far from the truth. NORAD is, of course, the North American Air Defense System with Canada 
that failed completely on 9-11 to intercept any of the planes. Well, it's another story. It's a, it was a computer crime. They were, they were diverted and things like that. Now, I told you that the 9-11 memorial was built by the Israelis. It was designed and built by this man here, who is Michael Arad, the son of the Israeli ambassador Moshe Arad. So they even, they even control the creation of the legacy. When, when school buses, when you go to New York City, the, the school buses park around the block at this place. And young kids are taken here and shown, this is what the Muslims did to us. This is, you know, this is, this is. And, and so that this, that they're creating this legacy of hatred against Middle Eastern people, Muslims. Uh, and, 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 and it's all being done to further the Israeli agenda. And the media, which is very much Zionist controlled as well, has for 17 years now pushed this false narrative about 9-11 and the war on terror. They've only been able to do that by suppressing the facts about what really happened. Because if they were to present the facts, they, their story would fall apart. Here we have the New York Times, three years after 9-11, the lead editorial. And this is a very telling comment, they say, in the very beginning, they say, in the three years since 9-11, We've begun to understand that it's possible to know what happened without knowing what happened. <laughs> now, this is the attitude that the, main, the, the, the biggest paper in New York City takes about 9-11 truth. The media should have done its own investigation. I'm just one person. I discovered a lot. Yeah. But, but if the New York Times and the media had done an investigation, they would have discovered so much more. But they couldn't do that. Their hands were tied. They're tied by their owners. So here's our, here's our political predicament in a nutshell. If the government and media are lying to us about 9-11, it means that they are controlled by the same people who carried out 9-11. That our media and our government are controlled by the people who carried out 9-11. That's a very serious state of affairs. But that's where, that's where the logic tells us where we are. Now, this is, the, this is the conclusion here. I'm going to show you the six crucial elements of Zionist control of 9-11. This is, this is the hexagram signal symbol. Uh, a lot of people associate this with Judaism, but this is actually the Zionist symbol. The Zionist symbol, not a, not a Jewish symbol. First point, law enforcement. The Zionist controlled law enforcement. Michael Sheratov was in charge of the investigation, the non-investigation, and destruction of evidence. Point two, the mass media, interpretation of the crime. We, we know Philip Zelikow wrote the commission report. The media interpreted it falsely. Here we have... Here's what he wrote, Catastrophic Terrorism in Elements of a National Policy in 1998. Then he went on to write this report. Third point, litigation. They control the court, legal discovery in the court. As I said, Alvin K. Hellerstein and his conflict of interest. Fourthly, they controlled security. They controlled security at the World Trade Center. They controlled security at the airports. These are the three guys, Shamir and, and Skukerman and Harrell. They own the company that, that screened the passengers at Boston Airport and Dulles Airport, what have you. It's an, it's an Israeli Mossad company. And as I showed you before, that the, the people that controlled security at the World Trade Center were Kroll Associates, where that uh, Avraham Shalom Bendor was working. Uh, fifth point is that they controlled the government. Our, at the time, George Bush, you have all of these people who are advisors second and third place advisors. Here, for example, Condoleezza Rice, Secretary of State, her advisor was Philip Zelikow, legal counsel. And this, is, this was the advisor to, to Cheney. And these are the advisors to the Pentagon. And the final point is that they control the military. They control the military in several ways. One of the most important ways is that they had control of the computers the, through P-TECH. They had control of all the, the, the government computers, airline computers, what have you but they also controlled the Defense Policy Board. So they controlled the military response to the crime. They called it an act of war, then they, they wrote this agenda that we will overthrow seven countries in five years. The rest is history. And as I said, that star is known in biblical times as the star of Renfan, which is a, a diabolical entity. Um, this is from the Bible. It says, yea, you took up the tabernacle of Moloch, and the star of your god, Remphan, figures which you made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Uh, this is to underline the point that 
9-11 was a hideous crime of evil incarnate. It, it's, you have to understand that the people that did 9-11 are absolutely evil to the core. And don't forget that. And so that those people don't deserve any sympathy or any compassion. The people that plan to carry out 9-11 are working for the devil. And here is the, is, I'm at the very end now. This is written by a man named Dr. Alan Soprosky, who was at the uh, United States Army War College, uh, director of studies. He wrote the introduction for my book, the little book on the war on terror. And he said, the evidential trail for 9-11 and the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq runs from PNAC, APAC, and their cohorts through the mostly Jewish neocons in the Bush administration and back to the Israeli government. None of the denials and political machinations can alter that essential reality. And this is the end. I, uh, this is a, a, a picture of me uh, the last uh, February at the, world, at the uh, Oscars. And you know, I had to sign with my friends Mike Chickie and Anne, 9-11 Truth is the peace movement. Because what I'm, what I'm trying to explain or show to the people at the Oscars is that we have to understand that the truth of 9-11 will bring us peace. Because when you understand the truth of 9-11, the, the logic of war evaporates. So thank you very much. The only way to defeat deception is to increase awareness of the truth.